if God doesn't move, are you okay? If God doesn't answer a request or a, or a prayer, can you still praise Him? Because it's easy to praise on the mountaintop. But here's the thing. Most of the time, the grass, the vegetation, the trees grow in the valley. And that's where God really develops us. And sometimes on the mountain, it's hard to distinguish whether it's your success or God's glory. And so we want to share this this song with you guys. Some of you will recognize it. And I want you to just really let the words and, and, the, and the mood of it minister to you, okay? They say sometimes you win some, sometimes you lose some. Right now, right now I'm losing back. Stood on this stage night after night, reminding the broken it will be alright. Right now, right now. So I want y'all to help us sing that second verse and we'll go on. 
to the end. They say it all takes a little
God for sharing with us more we don't deserve it. Can't earn it. Can't demand it. God, you share with us. Many times, God, we don't understand why we are where we are. May we plead with you. May the answer is taken longer than we think. God, I pray that we can find this faith. I pray, Lord, that we wouldn't miss anything you have for us. We open ourselves to you. God, allow you to minister to us. I thank you for what you're going to do in this place today, this evening. And God, in life today, God, in advance, Lord. Uh, just claiming the victory, the power of the Holy Spirit of God, the anointing presence of God. Lord, I pray for Roger today, God, it's just tremendously anointing, God, just tremendously touching, encouraging, and strengthening. Father, this morning, I pray that we be honest with you this morning, individually, corporately, to be honest. God, allow you to touch our lives in a way that you want. God, get the glory this morning. These are here. We just need to allow you to Thank you, Jesus, for being the greatest need of all time. That eternal life, everlasting life. Forgive us the sin on the cross of Calvary. We bless you in your name.
is that of God. You see, if we're going to help people's lives get changed, we've got to get their hands in here. That's what it's all about. And we sometimes don't like that. Matthew chapter 13, 31 says, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of the garden plants. Think through that. Now, there are three kinds of church growth. Hey, there's some blanks for you to fill in. Let me give them to you very quickly. You know this. It's a no-brainer, but I need to identify. The first one is biological growth. That's when we have babies and grandbabies, and they come, you get it. The second one is transfer growth, and you may have transferred here, hallelujah, but that's not spiritual kingdom growth. That's just moving the saints around a little bit. And isn't it sad? If I don't like this church, I'll just go to one down the road. Trust me, when you get there and been there a while, you won't like it either. I work with 2,185 churches, and can I tell you something? There's not a perfect church in the bunch because it's made up of sinners like you and me. You see, the church is not the building, it's not the campus, it's not the assets. I remember when I was a little baby boy in West Point, Mississippi, we used to say, here's a church, here's a steeple, open the door and there's all the people. We're the church. We is the church. And we need to understand that. The third growth is conversion growth. People coming to know Christ in a personal way. Now tonight I'm going to hit this really hard. I do hope you'll come back. You see, I would suggest to you that knowledge is getting us in trouble. You see, we got to teach Bible Sunday school, small group, as if we get more facts, we're going to get more spiritual. Can I just, this is not a trick question, but it is a trap, so don't anybody answer out loud. I'll develop it more tonight, but I need to ask you something. How many of us, don't, I mean, you can raise your hand on this one just so you feel good, so you feel holy. How many of you believe in Jesus? Raise your hand. Okay, now don't do that yet. How many of you believe the devil is real? You sit by him, right? Don't look at him. <laughs> I saw him. Here's the deal. Trap question. Does the devil know that Jesus is God's son, that he died on the cross, buried the bar to him, and rose on the third day? Does the devil know that? I will tell you, yes, he does. Does the devil make it to heaven? No. So you have to realize that there's a disconnect. Knowledge does not equate salvation. You see, salvation comes when we surrender our heart and put him on the throne of our lives. So I want to give you six reasons you ought to, I do, believe in church growth. Are you ready? We're going to do this very rapidly. I want you to follow along. Number one, because God commands it. You know the Great Commission, right? Matthew 28, 19 to 20, Jesus said, Go and sit on your hand in church. Could not know what most Baptists do? You see, I happen to know that 95% of all evangelicals have never shared their faith with anybody else. Never. And yet conversion is how we're going to keep people out of the bad place. I have parents who are sharing with their children how to be saved. I have grandparents who are trying to keep their kids loving them so they don't want to share their faith. Wow. It commands it. You see, the passage says we're to do three things. We're to make them, to win them to be converted, we're to baptize them. Ah, but here's the part I don't want you to miss. We, once we dump them, we usually forget them. Because it's the wrong scorecard. Most Baptists are scorecard is nickels and noses. How much can we bring in the pot? And how many people did you baptize, preacher? Let me tell you something. I'd like to change the scorecard. I'd like to say we have 17 adults in our church who are great, great, great spiritual grandparents right now. Wouldn't that be an interesting scorecard? How many 
many people know Jesus because of you? How many people have grown in their knowledge and their grace because of you? Let me tell you something. Life is tough. You know, I don't know what all you're going through. I have an MRI tomorrow on a spot on my liver. I have no idea. That's not something I'm looking forward to. The MRI is not the promise. Why do I show? But how do I live my life? You see, I thought the music set spoke to my heart. No matter what comes along, we need, people need the Lord. And we've got the best kept secret and we're often not telling about it. See, there's four places that talks about the Great Commission. I've given you that. I'm not going to park there. You, if you believe in the Bible, it's right there for you, okay? Number two, people need the Lord. We've already talked about that. Jesus died for us. I remember the 70s. Some of you weren't even thought of back then. But some of you were. Remember we had those musicals? Natural High, Good News, Tell It Like It Is. There was a song in one of those that said, People need the Lord. People dying every day. People grow in darkness. Let me tell you something. The darkness is getting darker. And we have the light. And where do you put a light bulb? There's where there's darkness. So God has placed some of you in situations that are very dark and gloomy because he wants you to illuminate the world. Wow. You say, well, I wish my God would change. I wish my family would change. Well, let me ask you, are you the catalyst? That is a big, fancy word. Are you the spark that can make that happen? So important. You see, as long as there's one person in this area that is lost, we ought to exist. And that would be our passion. Dr. Jim Futrell has said that over half of your county does not go to anywhere at all to church. They don't even identify with any type of faith or religious. That means Muslim, Hindu, not a Krishna. They don't believe in anything. Half of your county is out of way. Now, just can we be real honest for a second? I've got some family members that if they don't change, they're going to bust hell wide open too. Do you? Is that what you want? Is that what I want? No. And I work my heart. I don't condemn them. I love them. But I don't compromise what I believe. And I stand on the Word of God. Wow. We can let the church be comfortable. Oh, yeah. Do you know? How many of you are deacons? Raise your hands. You've got the courage. Okay, finance committee. Raise your hand. Oh, yeah, leadership team. How many of you used to work in the preschool area? Raise your hand. You were a babysitter. But Lord, you don't want the church to know that. My God, you can start bringing all them young couples in here. They'll start working them babies. And you know, and I done done my time in the nursery. Lord, I can't do that no more. If they birth them, I'll take care of them. I'm lying, I'm dying. And besides, they may make this five more toilet paper. And by golly, that young dude you invited to park in my parking place, preacher. How dare you? Let me tell you something. When I travel, my wife usually goes with me. Normally, she'll sit about where you are, sir. And when she does, it is not uncommon for somebody to pat her on the shoulder. Not to say, welcome to church. We're so glad you could be here. Ma'am, you're in my chair. I do safety security training all over the place. You know why most guests have to move down to the front? Because you bad this in the back if you own it. <laughs> she said, I do. <laughs> no, you don't. No, you don't. We say growth is a choice. It is absolutely a choice. You look at scripture and I've given you a whole lot. Look at the parable of the lost sheep. Look at the parable of the lost coin.
one. Look at the parables. Do you think God wanted to get or some word to us with all those parables? That we're not to be comfortable. That we're to look. The word is look. The word is look for those that need to be here. Wow. You see, evangelism and discipleship it's the same coin. Matter of fact, one of the things I have trouble with that is we want to separate it. We'll start having an evangelistic campaign. Holy God, hallelujah. Get somebody like somebody to both, you know, stomp around here in the boots and raise a big offering and they take the money away. Here's the deal. You see, that same coin is the discipleship to develop those people. To help them grow in the Lord. And if we help them grow in the Lord, then more people will come to know the Lord. Because when people see changed lives taking place in Temple Baptist Church, they go to want to know what in the world is going on down there. I gotta check that out because most of us don't want to be miserable. Most of us don't want to be sad. Most of us don't want to be mediocre. They want something. And I can tell you something, dear friend and brother, you are not going to find it on Facebook. <laughs> and I'll see some of you at the altar at the invitation. <laughs> we put more time in Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram than we do in the Bible. Woo-hoo! Preach on, bro! He has started back with that. I double dog daily <clears throat> to time how much you put in the Bible and how much time you really stay out of your smartphone no, in social media. No, 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 no. If you want to have fulfillment, you're going to swap the numbers. Number two, three, Jesus believed the church broke. He told Peter, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. Christ was conscious that we must spread the gospel in Matthew 5, 5. It says, the meek, the meek will inherit the earth. In 5, 13 to 14, you are the salt and the light of the earth. In Matthew 8, 11, many will come from the east and the west and take their place at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Matthew 24, 14, this good news I will preach into the whole world as a testimony of all the nations. Do you get the idea that God, Jesus himself, wants us to grow? Don't forget Jesus said the parable of the lost sower, the parable of the fig tree, the parable of the mustard seed, the parable of the yeast. Look at where we are, the parable of the great banquet. You came into this place today to be blessed. I want you to be blessed. But the real blessings will not come from great music, which we've had. The real blessing will not come from some sermon that the guy like yelled and stomped his foot. What the blessings are going to come from is Jesus, the Savior, the Messiah, the Christ. Probably not just on Sunday mornings, Sunday afternoons, or Sunday nights. Gang, they come every day, all day. You know Jesus. So, there's this number four. The nature of the church itself implies growth. Look at Romans 12, or 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 1 and 4, Colossians 1 and 2. Just who we are, we ought to grow. You see, life means growth. We live in a little bitty home in the uh, Richland area outside of Jackson. My wife and I are kind of holding up. Our children are grown. They live in Maryland. Virginia and Georgia, we have grandchildren all over there. So we have a little house that uh, we got when we moved here in 2014 after being in South Carolina for 24 years serving there. And my wife got some, look, she's one of those green thumb type people. She got these little plants, and I think she put them on steroids. Now you can't see the back dry because of all the bushes. She even has plants that's supposed to keep away mosquitoes. She, I'm just kind of going, duh. Screen doors keep them away too. Now here's the deal. Come on, think with me real quick. How do you know if a 
a plant is a goat alive or not? It's growing. If it's not growing, it's dying. Have you looked at your church? Are you flat -lined? Are you growing? That's life. And yeah, there's trouble with growing. Oh my goodness. With growth comes problems. Oh, that's okay. With dead badness come problems. Wow. Number five. The New Testament demonstrates numerical growth. I do not have time to develop this, but I absolutely do a whole sermon on Acts. We do the whole book in 30 minutes. But can I just get you a couple? Look at you. Just, just come on, follow it on real quick. It starts talking in the book of Acts at the beginning. There's 120. Got it? And then we have Pentecost and 3,000. And then it says that they added to the Lord every day. 3,000 plus 365 is 3,000. 365. And you keep going through it. And it says, then they grew the men grew to 5,000. Well, where there's a bunch of men, there's always some women. No disrespect, but that's just true. And where there's a bunch of women, there's always even more men. So we got more than 5,000. Estimating there's probably about 25,000 at that time. And then in Acts 5, 28, he said the whole Jerusalem was being filled. And Acts 6, 1, and then uh, on 6-7, it says the word spread, and they were just, just increasing, increasing 25 years. Whew, I'm already tired. <coughs> 25 years after Pentecost. Scholars believe there was 100,000 members of First Baptist Jerusalem. A hundred thousand. And they didn't have Facebook. They didn't have fax machines. They didn't have a telephone. Oh, my word. How in the world did a hundred thousand people hear about Jesus? Because somebody told them. Now, here's the, how many of y'all remember Paul Harvey? Any mind the only one? Boys and girls, young adults. Those of you that did not live in the good era, Paul Harvey was this incredible newscaster, commentator, and he had a little thing. He said, and now the rest of the story. Well, let me piggyback. The rest of the story is archaeologists say that Jerusalem only had about 200,000 people. So in 25 years, with intentionality, they reached one half of the entire population. You see, you have to decide what your goal is. You have to decide where you're going. I was telling this guy the other day, we're talking about some strategy stuff, and we start dealing with some stuff, and I said, if you don't know where you're going, how do you know when you get there? Tonight, we're going to talk about where do you want to go? not my decision. It's your decision as a congregation. It's your decision as a leader. Teenager, it's your decision what you're going to do with your life. You can't blame mom and daddy. And you may want to. For a while it will work. But eventually, you choose. You choose. I'm so weary of the entitlement mentality. And everybody's a victim. Let me tell you something. With Jesus, everyone is a joint heir with the Savior. Let's claim it. Number six, the fulfillment of prophecy demands the church grow. Now, I'm just going to just give that one to you. Then I'm going to tell you there's a few reasons some of us say we don't want it. And believe me, I can document it. Number one, God isn't interested in numbers. Oh, yeah? Where'd you get that? Can you show me that scripture? Matter of fact, talk about the hairs on my head. Well, they've been doing a lot of subtracting in late years. That's all right. He can do math. God is an interest in numbers. Let me tell you something. Numbers represent souls, and if churches are about the business of the church, it's changed lives, and we want more lives changed because when you change one life, it impacts a whole bunch of others. Wow. That's where we are. Number two, our church wants, oh, I love this one. We want quality, not quantity. Crop. That's a Baptist word. 
You didn't know that? It is. It's a Mississippi Baptist word. Crop. I think God wants both. Isn't it interesting that quality should generate quantity? And quantity should create some quality. I was talking about the band. I heard them when I came in this morning. Drove in three hours this morning. I tell you, the pastor, I said, they're pretty good, man. He said, well, we need a bass player. <laughs> I guarantee you there's a bass player within 12 miles of this church that didn't go to church anywhere this morning. <clears throat> but nobody's invited them to church here. Some of y'all think, well, yeah, I did go here. Then I expect you to bring you to church tonight. You know what? Now watch me here. Well, he may not be spiritual enough. Well, he's sure never going to be spiritual enough sitting at home. I consider the church a hospital for sinners. Wow. <coughs> large churches are impersonal. No, they're not. Because large churches are made up of small groups. Called Sunday school or small groups. And they study. Let me tell you something. In a venue like this, I can't ask you what's happening in your heart. I can't ask how this resonates with you. I can't say, well, tell me now, what did God speak to you on Tuesday in that Bible study you were doing? We can't do that. But that's why a lot of people want to come just to church. They don't want somebody asking, but you want God to bless you. You want God to heal you. You want God to do something in your life. You want to take care of your children. There's all these things you want God to do. Let me tell you something. God will do it, but you've got to do your part. He's not an ATM machine. If you don't put something in, you ain't going to get nothing out. <coughs> my children always thought, I go, kids, we got your money. And my little son, Perry, he looked like Dennis the Menace. He was mean as Dennis the Menace. And he has some Dennis the Menace now on his own. And praise God, he came back to sleep. <laughs> praise Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> Every time I said, Every hey, week, ain't money. Well, Dad, go by the bank and go to that machine. They'll give it to you. You didn't understand now that he's got one. You don't put it in, you ain't getting it out. That's right. What are you putting in? Oh, I came to church. Oh, give me a break. You could go to a ball game and get as much out of it. Matter of fact, some of us put more in the ball game than we do in church. Some of us get so excited, we'll shout, stand up, and trip all game. <coughs> Some of us even paint ourselves purple for a ball game. There's five things I want to suggest real quick, and we're going to close with. Number one, ask God where he wants you to serve. Yeah, serve. You see, I happen to believe every member is a minister. And if you don't know where God's calling you to come and serve, I would welcome you tonight. That's a discovery process. Because if you're doing something you're not happy, you're not going to invest your energy and passion. But can I tell you something? There's a lot of ministry waiting on you. You need to pray for church growth. This past year, we've been dealing with 3151 out of my office. Can you pray for three lost people? Can you learn one spiritual conversation? Can you invite five people every week to church? And can you share Christ? Since 95% have never done so in their lifetime. Wow. You see, I happen to believe that prayer isn't easy, but it is free and it's important. Now, let me help you here. You know, it's one thing to say, I'm praying for lost people. No, you need to pray for specific people who are lost, and then you need to roll up your sleeves, and you need to do something about the prayers. Amen. <coughs> Let me tell you something. God didn't have a set of strings on you to manipulate you. He doesn't have a set of strings to manipulate someone else. He gives us all the choice to make. And you need to encourage them to make the right choice. You are hands, heart, eyes, ears, tongue for Christ. That's what he's called you to do. 
If he did not want you to do your part, he could go ahead and call you on to heaven. But he's given you an opportunity not just to serve him, but actually, actually be blessed. Wow. You need to be a part of some kind of small group. And by the way, all small groups don't have to be at church. In your home. A breakfast meeting. As long as we're learning from the Lord. Now listen to me. Don't just learn the facts. Learn the lesson under the facts. We no longer just teach boys and girls that Jonah got swallowed by a big fish or a whale. We want to teach the boys and girls that yes, that's the storyline, but what happened was Jonah was disobedient and there were consequences. So when you start looking at a Bible study, you need to ask yourself, what is God telling me? What is the lesson that I need to learn and who can I tell what I learned today, what God spoke into my life? You see, you most of us are like a sponge. We suck it all up and we never squirt it up. Some of us got a lot we can squirt up. And most of us have family, friends, neighbors, colleagues that need a little bit of the squirt. You see, when people come into this space, when people meet you at work, people sit down by you at the diner, they ought to feel something unique is in your life. Not because necessarily what you said, because the Holy Spirit is just overflowing through you. That's blessings. Make a prayer list. Phone number five. Ask God to bring at least one person into your life in the next several weeks. Why do we believe in church growth? Because we believe in lives that are going to change. There's a wonderful little song. I heard when I was on staff at First Baptist Longview, Texas. I was a youth pastor. And the little boy that came up to see him was about four and a half years of age. And his left arm turned over. He was physically handicapped. And he sang a song, He's Not Through With Me Yet. He's not through with you yet either. He's getting the chance to make a decision to make a difference and to pretty change lives. Just a moment, I'm going to pray. The pastor will be here. Could it be that God's spoken to you that you need to, no matter what your age, you can do a little more? Not out of a sense of burden or mandate, but because you love Jesus more. But here's the thing. You cannot be a disciple if you never made Jesus truly Lord of your life. You don't know Christ. You see, you may know all the facts, but he's not running your life. He's not your lifeline. Maybe you need to come and discover how to truly have Jesus as Savior and Lord. Whatever your decision would you come talk to your pastor? Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this congregation, for this pastor, for the opportunity to get to know him, to know his heart, to know that he loves these dear people. God, I know you love these people because you sent your son. You love them so much that he died on the cross. You love them so much not to leave them as they are, but he wants to change them to be more like him every day. Father, may we surrender our lives to you today in a powerful way. May we recommit our lives to be all about you, our family, our jobs, our school, whatever it may be, Lord, we give it to you. Bless us now and speak into our hearts. And Lord, if someone needs to pray this prayer, Jesus, I know without a doubt you died on the cross for me. I know these things, but now I surrender my heart. I give you my soul. Take it. Save me. Fill me, I pray. And Lord, if someone prays that prayer today, I'll ask that they come and shake this pastor's hand and begin a new journey of growing in faith in Christ's likeness.
Bless us now as we surrender to you, I pray in Christ's name. Amen.